okay so so when both agents have convex preferences and this is let's say your endowment point then the final budget line is a line with slope of minus p so the slope of this dashed line will be minus px by p by which if we assume these values is going to be equal to minus p and it should satisfy that if you draw such a dashed line then both the agents should be demanding the same point on the edgeworth box so this becomes the allocation point the final allocation point okay so you use the budget equations like this uh, that is budget constraint so if this would be the income of agent a if he sells everything at prices pn1 this will be the income of agent b if he sells everything at prices pn1 this would be the expenditure of agent a if he buys this point x a vector this will be the expenditure of agent b if he buys the same point uh, and apart from that you just use this mrs of agent a at x a vector must be equal to mrs of agent b at x b so you use this bunch of equations you can always find the equilibrium so finding equilibrium when both agents are convex preferences is just a set of steps i can tell you you can uh, you can learn them and you can apply it in the exam so it's very straightforward no application of brains required and that's why exams don't like it okay so the good exams they rarely ask questions where both agents have convex preferences but they do ask some analytical questions based on it or they can ask you questions where you are given let's say three agents okay so they can give you three agents in the past years you'll see one such question where you have three agents and uh, two you have three agents and two goods and uh, you have to solve it using excess demands <clears throat> so let's move on now to other cases so other popular cases so what we are going to do is so you can have some different combinations in what is the preferences of agent a and what are the preferences of agent b so every such combination will give rise to different situations and we cannot solve each of these different situations separately because we don't know what kind of new preferences the examiner comes up with so we are going to look at certain popular preferences which are basically perfect substitutes perfect complements and lexicographic and we are going to see how to find the equilibrium in different settings so that is going to build our analytical acumen so that we can handle any different situation which is given to us so let's start with the second case the first case was convex both convex so let's start with the second case where you have both perfect substitutes so perfect substitutes perfect substitutes okay so both agents have perfect substitutes preferences so in this case the first part is 2a where mrs of agent a is equals to mrs of agent b so both agents have the same slopes of their indifference curves so if i draw the ic's of agent a they are going to look like this okay so ic's of agent a will look like this and ic's of agent b here will also look similar because i am assuming that the mrss are same so i'm just going to draw them slightly moved from these ics but they are going to be coincidental basically because you know it's not just these four lines are the ics every point has a ic passing through it of the same slope so you actually have ics from the same slope so, so so both agents will have same ics every ic will be common to both the agents now let's say uh, i start off with some endowment point like this 
So agent A wants to go above his indifference curve. Okay, so what is the aim of any agent to go above his indifference curve? That makes this agent gain higher utility. So the a aim of agent A is to go above his indifference curve, which is basically this region. And what is the aim of agent B? Agent B's aim is to go above his indifference curve. But remember, agent B's world has been tilted upside down. So the way we are visualizing it, what agent B wants to do is go below the indifference curve. Okay, so ideally he wants to go above, but since his world has been tilted upside down in the realm of uh, Edgeworth box, it appears as if he wants to go below the indifference curve. So as you can see, there is no intersection between these two zones. Right, so there is no intersection between these two zones. So there is no Pareto improvement possible. No Pareto improvement is possible. So when there is no Pareto improvement possible, this point becomes Pareto efficient. And remember, we started off with an arbitrary point. We did not say take a point in the midpoint or on the edge. I just said took some arbitrary point on the Edgeworth box. Mm -hmm. And I lead to the conclusion that this arbitrary point is Pareto efficient. So now that this point is Pareto efficient, this should be true for every point on the Edgeworth box. No matter where you start your analysis from, you'll get a similar result. Right, so you can start off with some other point like this, let's say, and you'll see that agent A wants to go above, agent B wants to go below, no intersection, Pareto efficient. So all points are Pareto efficient. So the entire Edgeworth box itself is Pareto efficient. So the contract curve is the entire Edgeworth box. So there is going to be no voluntary trade. No voluntary trade at all. So there is no trade, there is no scope of equilibrium prices and all those things. So this case is pretty simple. Okay. Now let us look at the case where the indifference curves don't are not coincidental. So let us look at the case where MRS A is not equal to MRS B. So let us take this case to B, where let's say for for uh, some generality, I am just taking MRS A is greater than MRS B because one of them has to be greater. If two numbers are not equal, one of them has to be greater. So I'm just assuming that. MRS of A is greater than MRS of B. Okay. So now I'm going to assume that agent A's ICs are going to be steeper. So they look like this. So agent, IC, agent A's ICs are going to look like this. And agent B's ICs they are going to be flatter, so they will look like this. Okay, so this is my origin of agent A, and this is my origin of agent B. Now let me start off with some arbitrary point like this. So focus on agent A. Where does this agent want to go? He wants to go above his indifference curve, which is basically this region. Right. And where does agent B want to go? Agent B wants to go below his indifference curve, which is basically this region. So you see this common region, which is highlighted in green, is the region in which both agents want to go to work. So voluntary trade will take you in this direction. So when I'm, the first step in any situation which is given to you is to identify 
the contract curve. So this is going to be the first step that we do whenever we look at any new setting. So how do I look at, how do I identify the contract curve? So start with any arbitrary point in the Edgeworth box and decipher the direction of voluntary trade. And the third step is going to be uh, take assumptions on the contract curve and check. All right, so the third step is, so now I've seen that from any arbitrary point, the voluntary trade takes me down and towards the right. So my general feeling is that my contract curve should be here or here, because this general thing is true for any point. It's not just true for this point. Even from this point, trade happens, takes me in this direction. And this will be true for all such points. So wherever I start from, I'm seeing this movement towards bottom and right. So at any intersection point, I'm seeing a movement towards bottom and right. So I have this feeling that maybe voluntary trade is taking me towards the bottom or the right edge. So in this case, I have a hunch. What is the hunch? The hunch is that the contract curve is the bottom and left and right edge. Right edges of the Edgewood box. So that's a hunch which I have. So next step is to check, check the hunch. So what's going to be the checking part? So the checking part is you take any point on whatever you assume to be the contract curve and check if voluntary trade can happen from this point. So let us take this point for example. So if I take this point, for example, then agent A at this point wants to go above his indifference curve, which is this region. And agent B wants to go below his indifference curve, which is this region. And as you can see, there is no intersection of these two zones. So this point is indeed very top efficient. And a similar result will hold for a point on the right edge. For a point on the right edge as well, you can see that agent A wants to go in this direction and agent B wants to go in this direction. So again, there is no intersection. So this point is also very efficient. Okay. So the entire bottom and right edge are the contract curve. This is the contract curve. Yeah. You can even check that the top or the right edge are not the contract curve. Because if you look at a point like this, then agent A wants to move here. Wrong color. Agent A wants to move here. And agent B wants to move here. So the intermediate zone is in fact my Pareto improvement. So in this direction, I'll see voluntary trade happening. So that's my first step. First step is to always analyze what is the contract curve because you usually get two types of questions here. What's going to be the contract curve and what's going to be the equilibrium price vector. So we are going to look at two major questions in every setting. What is the contract curve and question the second question is what is the equilibrium price vector basically p because we assume py to be one we are just finding px <clears throat> so now let's find out what's going to be the equilibrium price vector okay but to do that i start off with an individual having perfect preferences, perfect complements as his, uh, 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 his indifference curves as perfect. So perfect substitutes preferences. So let's say these dashed line, 
they represent the indifference curves of some agent. Okay, so these are the indifference curves of some agent. Now, suppose that the budget line is steeper than the than the preferences, like this. Suppose this is my budget line, where slope of the budget line in magnitude terms purely is greater than MRS of the agent. Then what point will this agent pick for utility maximization? Y axis. Y axis or the Y intercept. So he is going to pick his Y intercept. In an alternate setting, when the slope of the budget line is, let's say, flatter, like here. Okay, so this is the setting where the slope of the budget line is lower than the MRS. Then by analog analogous logic, he's going to pick the x-intercept. Right. So with that simple logic in mind, just remember that when slope of budget line, when budget line is steeper, pick the y-intercept. When budget line is flatter, this guy picks the x-intercept, okay? <clears throat> so with that logic in mind, let us now come back to my Edgewood box and see the situation where we had agent B's indifference curves, how was it? Yeah, agent B's indifference curves were flatter, which looked like this. And agent A's indifference curves were steeper and they looked like this. Now assume any random budget line, which is passing through the, this point like this. Let me draw it from here. Suppose this is a random budget line. So the idea to find the equilibrium price vector is, so what's going to be the algorithm? So start with some arbitrary budget line and check the excess demands. Okay, so that's going to be the first step that I'm going to start with some arbitrary budget line, which looks like this, and then I'm going to look at the excess demands. Okay, so this is my origin of agent A who has steeper ICs. This is origin of agent B who has flatter ICs. So focus on agent A for the time being. So the dashed line represents his budget line and the blue line represents his indifference curve. So clearly the indifference curve is uh, indifference curve is steeper than the budget line. So indifference curve is steeper than the budget line. That is budget line slope is smaller than the MRS. So in this case, what point will agent A pick? So you can see this MRS is slope of the budget line. So the budget line is steeper. So MRS of agent A is greater than the slope of the budget line that I have assumed. So what point will this guy pick? X-intercept. X-intercept. Very good. So this is the point which agent A picks. Now let us talk about agent B. What point will agent B pick? So for agent B, I see that MRS of agent B is less than slope of the budget line, right? You see the budget line is the dashed line, which is having a higher slope. The MRS, uh, sorry, the indifference curve relatively has a flatter slope. So in this case, yeah, so in this case, we had X intercept. 
in this case, the XB vector is going to be the Y intercept. Yeah, so it's an analogous logic. Now this is going to be very crucial, okay? So this is very important because when you know these tricks, you can reduce your analytical time in exam. Okay, if you don't know all this and you sit to derive all these things in an exam, it will take you a lot of time. So the point that agent B picks now, it's going to be his y-intercept. Now remember the y-axis of agent B is this one. This is the y-axis of agent B. Right? This is the vector yb. Remember? If you remember, this was xA, the xB, and this was yb. Okay, we flipped agent B's word. So if I extend the budget line here, the point that he's going to demand is actually going to be this one. So this is going to be the demanded bundle for A. This is going to be the demanded bundle for O. So clearly they are demanding different bundles, which implies that this cannot be an equilibrium. So then I analyze the excess demands. So the demand for good X, the complete demand for good X is coming only from agent A, which is this much, which implies that there is excess supply of good X. And the total demand for good Y is coming from agent B, which is this much which is higher than the total supply of, sorry, total demand for good Y is this much, which is greater than the total supply. Total supply of good Y is the height of the Edgeworth box. That is the total availability of good Y in this economy. So what I see is that there's an excess demand of Y. Now, what happens to the price of any good if there is excess supply of that good? What happens to the price of any good whose supply is greater than demand? It reduces. It falls. It falls. So Px will fall. And if there is excess demand, then PY should increase. So this ratio PX upon PY as a whole should fall. Now remember, PX by PY is the magnitude of slope of the budget line that I had assumed. So what the analysis tells me is that my budget line should get flatter. So let me flatten out the budget line and let me construct another budget line now. So let me construct a budget line which is flatter than the initial one, which let's say looks like this. So let's say I'm assuming this to be my budget line. Now, still, this thing holds true. Still, the indifference curve of A is steeper than the budget line, so he'll still demand his x-intercept, but his x-intercept now is going to be this point. And agent B still demands his y-intercept because this is also true, right? So. The budget line is still steeper than the indifference curve of B. So he will demand his y-intercept. The y-intercept is now this point. So this is my xp vector. So now when I analyze x's demands, the demand for good x is this much, which is higher than the supply. So there's an x's demand of x. 
and the demand for good y is this much which is lower than the supply so there is an excess supply for good y so what this implies is that my px should go up and what this excess supply implies is my py should go down so px by py as a whole should increase right so i should see a movement of the budget line in this direction i should see it get steeper so when i drew a budget line which looked like this i saw that the forces of nature the forces of market are pushing it towards this direction when i draw it like this i'm seeing that they should be moving it should be moving in a downward direction so what do you think would be the equilibrium price line or equilibrium budget line look like can you characterize it geometrically like what should be the characteristic of an equilibrium budget line so it passes through the corner, corner. very good great so it should the equilibrium budget line should pass through the corner okay so let's draw that budget line now the budget line passing through the corner now agent a still this is true he still demands his x intercept so this is going to be my x a vector and agent b is ke liye agent b ke liye this is still true so he still demands his y intercept which is this point so they together demand this point which is the same point on the edge board box okay. so they together would demand the same point on the edge board box so the price vector in this case if i have this point let's say i have this point as uh, something like 4, 7 and this point as uh, let's say 9 comma 15 no sorry 15 not 9 comma 15 9 comma 0 then the slope of this line segment will give me the slope of the budget line just this line segment will give me the slope of the budget line so how do i find the slope the slope is delta y by delta x so delta y is 7 minus 0 delta x is 4 minus 9 so that is equal to minus 7 by 5 now this is slope which is minus px by py so the equilibrium price vector will be the magnitude of this which is going to be 7 by 5 so in this case the equilibrium price vector p by 1 is going to be 7 by okay so in cases like this you have to first identify which is going to be my contract curve which in this case turned out to be these two line segments and then the corner which is connecting these two arms is going to be the equilibrium point but not necessarily always i'll come to that but before that any doubts from this part according to whatever is happening with excess demand so this will make our yeah sorry uh my internet may be went down for a bit uh can you guys see the screen can you guys hear me can you guys see the screen yes sir all right fine i hope i uh, you didn't lose any important stuff okay cool 
so this is the analysis for the case of uh, when when the mrss are not same but there are some extreme sort of situations here okay so my idea is that okay in this case what is going to be the final allocation this point is my final allocation okay but this final allocation should actually lie in the perito improving zone right so this is the perito improving zone and this final allocation lies in the perito improving zone now what happens if this does not lie in the perito improving zone so for example i case consider a very extreme case right say <clears throat> this is my ic for agent a and uh, this is my ic for agent b i'm starting off from this point now if you connect these two points and try to find the price vector it's going to be wrong because this corner is not a perito improvement over the endowment this is not a perito improvement over the endowment so now the question is what happens in this case what happens in this case so in this situation whatever budget line so this budget line is out of the question because this budget line is taking me here it's not even a perito improvement so it won't happen so i start off with some arbitrary budget line again a similar thing which i always do i start off with some arbitrary budget line so i know agent a will pick this point because he picks his x intercept the steeper guy always picks his x intercept the flatter guy he will pick the y intercept which will be some point like this okay so this implies that there is excess supply for good x so px should fall there is excess demand for good y you see the demand for good y is this much so py should rise so as a whole px by py should fall so my equilibrium price vector should keep on reducing so it should go in this direction but how far can it go in this direction the max i can do is make it intersect with the red indifference curve so the maximum the indifference curve, the budget line can do is this one because it cannot go below this because if it goes below this you will end up in a zone that is definitely not perito improvement okay so if i take any budget line which is flatter than this like here then agent a will start demanding this point agent b will simply disagree to this point because agent b will say that this point is above his ic so agent b wants to go in this direction right so this point is unfathomable for agent a it's blasphemy you say i am not going to this point so the max you can do is your budget line coincidental with the budget line of the guy with the <clears throat> the flatter then what happens to agent a what point will agent a pick if his budget line is coincidental with his ic okay so for agent a sorry not agent a this is agent b for agent b mrs is equal to slope of the budget line so what happens in perfect substitutes when mrs is equals to slope of the budget line so he'll be in different for all the bundles he'll be in different over all the bundles so now what happens is agent a continues to pick his x intercept which will now be this point 
सो एजेंट ए से आई वॉन्ट टू गो ही एजेंट बी विल से चलो चलते हैं Okay, so agent B will agree because he is indifferent around all the points. So in a situation like this, when the former point is not a Pareto improvement, then what happens is uh, that one of the ICs will become the budget line. Now, which one will depend on case to case basis? Because if I had taken a situation like here. then you would see that this was agent a this was agent b so in this case you would see that this becomes the coincidental uh, budget line so that will depend on a case to case basis you might have to analyze it a little bit maybe draw some rough edge word box draw the lines and do it so so yeah so that's how it is so if this is not a pareto improvement point then either this case will happen or this case will happen so how do we identify when you are in this case in this case or in this case so it really depends on your endowment point so start with your endowment point e check this slope m if this m is between mrs b and mrs a then you are in this zone okay so i am giving some rules you don't need to remember them by the way because you know there will be a lot of rules there will be a lot of rules so i want you not to remember them but i want you to be able to reproduce them in an exam so try to understand them try to watch the videos again and again because we are going to do a bunch of cases a dozen cases and you are not going to be remembering every one of them yeah so in this case straight up budget line becomes the line connecting endowment point to this corner when the slope is lower than both of them when m is lower than both mrss okay so in that case budget line ka slope becomes equal to the minima of the mrss and when it is greater like in this case if you connect the endowment point with the corner it will be a line which has a slope higher so when slope is greater than both the mrss then budget line will be equal to max that is the steeper guy the steeper of the two mrss okay so that's going to be the rule of thumb that when you have situations like this one the budget line will be coincidental with this guy and in that case the endowment point is just going to be the x intercept so they'll move from here sorry the allocation point is going to be the x intercept they'll move from here to here whereas in this case it's going to be this point so they'll move from here to here they'll finally always end up at one of the points on the contract row that's for sure okay so all a voluntary trade eventually ends up on the contract row right okay so that wraps up the discussion about both the preferences being perfect substitutes now let's do case 3 which is perfect substitutes and convex so let's suppose you have agent a having convex preferences which look like this and agent b having perfect substitutes which looks like this starting from some endowment point like here now if i take any arbitrary budget line i know that 
एजेंट बी एजेंट बी ही विल ऑलवेज पिक आइदर दी एक्स और दाई इंटरसेप्ट अनलेस इट इज को इंसिडेंटल अनलेस इट इज को इंसिडेंटल ही विल ऑलवेज पिक वन ऑफ दी इंटरसेप्ट सो एजेंट बी पिक्स a boundary point unless mrs of b is equals to slope of the budget line. okay unless mrs of b is equals to slope of the budget line he'll pick a boundary point but agent a he has convex preferences so he will pick an interior point he will pick the point of tangency like this so that is going to be an interior point on the edgeworth box so the only possible equilibrium here is when so this case is definitely not possible so the only possibility becomes mrsb equals to slope of the budget line so mrsb equal to slope of the budget line will give me this condition so slope automatically becomes so the slope of the guy with perfect substitutes automatically becomes the endowment uh, the allo uh, the price vector and then you can find once you have the price vector you can solve the utility maximization problem and get the solution to this one now about the contract curve what about the contract curve so so contract curve will be the points of tangencies so contract curve will be mrs of agent a is equals to mrs of agent b so if you have multiple ics like this then all the tangency points will be your contract curve will form your contract curve okay so it will look something like this it will look something like this and once it reaches here if it does not meet at the corner it will go towards the corner okay so that's going to be the contract curve this part is easy to understand mrs a equals to mrs b what i have a doubt in is this part the question is why are these points very to efficient so let us check these points okay so how do i check these points so first of all i'm going to draw the line which gives me mrs a equals to mrs b so suppose this is the line that gives me mrs a equals to mrs b okay this is my origin of agent a this is origin of agent b so i'm convinced that all these points are perito efficient because along all these points i do not see any perito improvement possible so to see this consider any tangency point like here this is a tangency point agent a wants to go above the indifference curve agent b wants to go below the indifference curve no intersection so all the tangency points which are given by mrs a equals to mrs b automatically become the perito efficient points Now the question is about points like this one. So let us draw A and B's indifference curves here. 
So A's indifference curve through this point will look like this. This is agent A's indifference curve. Let me draw it in blue. This is agent A's indifference curve. And agent B's indifference curve will look like this. Okay. The reason it cannot be steeper than the blue line, the reason it cannot be steeper like this is because had it been steeper like this, then there would have been another tangency point here. Right. Graphically, you can see it. Let me magnify this image. So suppose you have this corner represented here. And through this corner, you have some IC of agent A passing like this through this point. My claim is that B's IC from here will definitely be lower than A's IC. The slope is going to be lower because had it been steeper, for example, like this, then I could have found another tangency point here. Okay, so this is an analytical proof that is sufficient for us right now. We don't want a deep mathematical proof here. The important thing to understand is why is this Perry coefficient? Okay, that is all we care about. So we are just looking at a mathematical proof about why is this corner, this corner line segment Perry coefficient. So had this line been steeper, I would have found another tangency point here like this. But you know, all the tangency points are along this line. There are no tangency points of the line. This is the equation of all the tangency points. So this cannot happen. So this cannot be steeper. So it has to be essentially flatter. So there's going to be no tangency ahead. So when the So when this indifference curve is like this, then you know that agent A wants to go above his indifference curve, agent B wants to go below his indifference curve, no intersection, which automatically implies that this point is very low efficient. So let us do a quick example, a mathematical example to find out the contract curve and uh, yeah, so find out the contract curve and other things. So the example is let utility of agent A is equals to X A Y A and utility of agent B is equals to X B plus Y B. Endowment of agent A is given as EA is equals to, let's say, 2,4. And this guy's endowment is given as EB equals to 4,4. So find the contract curve, complete contract curve, and the equilibrium allocation. Okay, so I have to find the contract curve and the equilibrium allocation. Okay. So quickly, what is going to be my equilibrium price ratio P by one? What is this going to be? You open the two page format. Can you see this? No, let it be. I hope you guys remember whatever I told you. <laughs> yeah. So I said that the only possibility is the slope of budget line becomes equal to the 
slope of the interference curve for the guy with perfect substitute. So what's going to be the equilibrium price vector? Yeah, anyone, what's going to be the equilibrium price vector? Anyone? Are you guys with me? Am I audible? Okay, what is MRS of agent B? If this is my utility function, what is MRS of agent B? One. One. So what's going to be the equilibrium price vector? What is slope of the budget line? Minus Px by Py. Yeah, so mod of minus Px upon Py must be equal to one, which implies what? Px equal to Py. Which implies P what equals to what? In this setting, P equals to what? Remember, Py is always Ma one. Okay. In general equilibrium, P y is always one. Okay, so that's how we'll proceed. So yeah, so this implies that P x equals to P y equals to one. So that's going to be your equilibrium price vector. Okay. So if P x becomes equals to P y equals to one, and the endowment of agent A is two comma four. So remember, once you have figured out in this case that price vector, what is the price vector? Once you set agent B's MRS equals to price vector. Agent B has no power. He is saying that my indifference curve. Pe I'll accept anything. He is saying I'll accept anything on my indifference curve. So all power rests with agent A. He has to pick the point. So now consider agent A. This is his utility function. U A equals to X A Y A. His endowment X A into Y A. His endowment is equals to two comma four. And the price vector is Px equals to Py equals to 1. So what's going to be the solution for utility maximization problem? So three comma three. Very good. Three comma three. Yeah. So it's simple. I mean, you just sell everything. When you sell everything, your income becomes equals to two into one plus four into one. So that is equals to six. Then x equals to i by two px, which is six by two into one, which is three. Y equals to i by two py. So this I'm using directly from what we had in consumer theory our Marshallian demands. So if you can remember it, great. If you don't remember it, use Lagrange and solve it. Okay, so I by two PY, so that's going to be six by two into one. So that is going to be three. So three comma three is the final bundle. Okay, so the equilibrium allocation is three comma three for A and the remaining goes to B. So what's left with B is, what will B have? If A takes the bundle three comma three, what is left for B? Come on, this is an easy one. Swami Jyoti, haven't heard from you. Uh, what's going to be the bundle which B has? Uh, 
Hello, Swami Jyoti. Can you hear me? Yeah, one comma one. Why one comma one? What is the total availability of X? Total is six. So if A takes away three, what is left for X? Or what is left for B of good X? Three. What about good Y? What is the total availability of good Y? Eight. Eight may say three gear. Five. Five. Okay. So that's how you do it. Okay. So once you find A's allocation, B will take whatever is remaining. All right. Now coming to the contract curve. What's going to be the equation of the contract curve? Remember, the contract curve equation is MRS A equals to MRS B. So x okay, equal so to y. X equals to y. Very good. X equals to y. But what is the total dimension of the Edgeworth box, by the way? So what is the total dimension of the Edgeworth box? So 6 by 8. 6 by 8. So it's a rectangle which looks like this. 6 cross 8 rectangle. And you're saying that this line, 45 degree line, is my contract curve, right? So you're saying the contract curve is xa equals to yk, which is this line. So it's basically this line till it hits the right corner and then something above it. So the entire contract curve is this two, these two arms, a vertical arm and a 45 degree arm. That is going to be my contract curve. Okay, is this part clear? So that's how you can do these questions. This, this is going to be very easy, right? So convex with perfect substitutes, very easy. Because, you know, one of the things is finding price vector. Price vector, finding price vector is difficult in other situations. But whenever we have perfect substitutes with convex, the MRS of this perfect substitute sky automatically becomes the price vector. All right, so that wraps up everything about perfect substitutes. Let's go to the fourth part which is perfect complements. So now Excuse I have me, a situation. Sir? Yeah. So is PY equal to one assumed in every case? Or in no, this it depends case on what only? this is. Depends on what this is. So suppose I gave you utility of A equals to X A Y A and utility of B equals to three X A plus four Y A. So this MRS, what will be this MRS Kanishka? So three by four. Three by four. So this becomes my price vector Px by Py, which is basically P by one. So it depends on what is the slope of the perfect substitute sky. So when it comes to price vector, perfect substitutes for deco get. Okay. So in cases like this, it is always the perfect substitute sky who's going to decide the price vector. Right. So this guy is slope will give you the price, the budget line automatically. Okay, sir. I gave you a rather simpler example right now in class because, you know, uh, the idea is going to be the same. There's no point giving you a complicated example because you know how to find MRS, you know how to do utility maximization, all those things you already do. No, we have done complicated questions related to those already. Now we are just linking the dots. Usko use kaise karna hai. Okay, so I'm hoping that when it comes to more, let's instead of this, you get something like x to power one by three, y to power two by three, and something like three x plus four y here, you should be able to handle that. Okay, but that's going to be the steps. First, you find the price vector, then everything become, everything falls in place. Anyway, coming to the fourth part, Perfect complements with perfect complements. Okay. 
So now both guys have pocket complements preferences. So I'm going to take, so when it comes to perfect substitute, the important thing is what are the MRSs? When it comes to perfect complement, the important thing is what is the line of vertices? What is the line of vertices? So remember that uh, for utility equals to min of x a y a. Okay, so when we had utility equals to min of x comma y, sorry. Then the ICs were these uh, L-shaped curves, which were joined along the 45 degree line. So the ICs, they were used to look like this. Right, so these were my ICs. So the, so the line which is dividing these two arms, which was the 45 degree line in this case, becomes the line of vertices. Okay. So suppose you have utility equals to min of 3x comma 2y. So the line of vertices is given by the equation 3x equals to 2y. So that is when the two arms would meet. So that would be my line of vertices. So the line of vertices when you have this utility function would be 3x equals to 2y. Now we did, if you remember the very first chapter of microeconomics, we did a lot of complicated min-max related questions so that you could be able to decipher what is the line of vertices for different situations. So now we are going to analyze everything in terms of line of vertices. Why? The reason is very simple. Consider any perfect substitutes guy with this as the line of vertices, which means that his ICs will basically look like this. These are going to be his ICs. Now consider any budget line here. Consider any budget line here. Okay. So suppose this is ICA, ICB, and ICC. Then which IC is going to be the highest indifference curve which this guy can reach given this budget line? Which is the highest indifference curve? I can draw one about. Let me call this ICA. IC. Yeah, ICA is the highest indifference curve we can reach. And this becomes my chosen point. This becomes my demand, Marshall and demand expected. So given any budget line, a guy with perfect complements always picks the point where the budget line intersects the line of vertices. So you don't really need these indifference curves. All you need is the line of vertices and the budget line. If I give you line of vertices and budget line, you can just look at the intersection and say, this is going to be the point. Okay. So in fact, if you were solving the utility maximization for this case, you would use this as one equation. The other equation will be px x plus pyy is equals to i. You use these two equations, you will find your equilibrium demand. And that is essentially, if you look at it from a vantage point of linear algebra, it is essentially the intersection of these two lines. Solving this system of linear equations is nothing but solving the intersection of these two lines. So you don't really need all the ICs. All you need is the line of vertices. So that's why all the discussion we are going to make is going to be in terms of line of vertices. Okay. So one bottom line is that the guy with perfect complements will pick the point of intersection of budget line with the line of vertices. Okay. So now suppose you have two guys, 
So now let's come to general equilibrium bet. You have two guys, origin of agent A with the line of vertices of agent A looking like this. And some agent B with the line of vertices of agent B looking like this. These are not intersecting. They, they need not be parallel actually. The important thing is that they are not intersecting. They look like this, let's say. They are not intersecting. That's all I care about. So then, what would be my contract row? The first thing is always contract row. Contract row, okay. So I'll start off with some arbitrary point. Let's see this one. Starting from this point, agent A's indifference curve from this point will be this vertical line, this horizontal line. So agent A wants to go in this general direction. Agent B's indifference curve from this point will be this horizontal line and this vertical line, right? So remember agent B's world is flipped upside down. So his indifference curves, they look like this. And he wants to go below his indifference curve, which is this one. So this entire rectangular area, which is lying in between, becomes the zone for Perito improvement. The entire rectangle is Perito improvement. Now, when you have this entire rectangle as Perito improvement, then now let me start off with some random budget lines. Let's start off with any budget line like this. Okay. Okay, no, forget. Let's complete the analysis of uh, contract curve first. Okay, so Perito improvement direction here. Let me take the opposite endowment point here. So again, I see this rectangle becomes Perito improvement because Everything is essentially same. So this becomes the direction of voluntary trade. So I'm seeing that trade is taking me towards this intermediate zone. So my hunch is that the intermediate zone is Perito efficient. That is my hunch. The zone between the two line of vertices is Perito efficient. So let us check this claim. Let us check the claim that the zone between is Perito efficient. So let's start off with a point in between. Now, B's indifference curve through this point, they are going to look like this. And A's indifference curve from this point is going to look like this. Right, so agent A wants to go above, agent B wants to go below. Okay. Can this movement moving from here to, let's say this point, can this movement be considered a Perito improvement? Would you consider moving from this point to this point a Perito improvement? Yes, Vinay, what do you think? Would this be a Perito improvement? So no, since it lies on the same two ICs even after the moment. 
yeah so it remains on the same ic's for both of them so none of them is being made better off so the condition is at least one person should be made better off and nobody should be made worse off here yes nobody is being made worse off but there is no improvement nobody is getting happier so this is not a perito improvement obviously going above is not a perito improvement going down is not a perito improvement because in either cases at least one of the guy gets worse off right so if you move up agent b says no if you go down agent a says no moving right left not perito improvement so no perito improvement is possible so this point is actually perito efficient and this will be true for all these points so the contract curve is essentially the zone between these two regions these two line of vertices so when they are not intersecting the perito efficient points are going to be points between the two regions between the two lines okay now how about uh, so yeah so i've already identified what's going to be my sorry <clears throat> uh yeah i've already identified what's going to be my uh <clears throat> contract curve this entire thing is my contract curve the contract curve is not really curve now it's a complete band of points now let's come back to the analysis of equilibrium price vector we start off from some arbitrary point like this we draw the indifference curve for a we draw the indifference curve for b and we start off with some arbitrary such big line so let me know if you disagree that agent a will pick this point and agent b will pick this point right because every agent with perfect complements picks the intersection point of the budget line which is here with their individual line of vertices so this is line of vertices of a and this is line of vertices of b so they are going to pick the individual intersection points so if i try to look at the total demand for good x then this is the demand for good x coming from agent a this is x ka demand this is y ka demand let me remove some unnecessary things so as to declutter the oh so as to declutter the figure so the total demand for good x is this plus this which is lower than the total supply because total supply is the entire base of the edge worth box so there is going to be excess supply of good x which implies what happens to px yes somi jyoti somi jyoti what will happen to px Are you with us, Swami Jyoti? Okay, anybody else? So it will, will fall. Happen? It will fall, right? So there's excess supply, so P X should fall. At the same time, if I look at the demand for good Y, it is this and this, so that is greater than the total supply. So there's excess demand of good Y. which implies what happens to py it should go up right so px by py as a whole should fall and it should keep falling you know i mean there's no end to how much it should fall 
it just keeps on falling it keeps on going in this direction till it becomes absolutely flat because no matter how flat you take this this analysis will remain the same suppose you take something like this a very flat budget line so even in that case what happens is that the demand bundles they are going to change obviously but you will see that there will still be excess supply for good x because you know good x is going to be demanded this much by this agent and this much by this agent and good y is going to be demanded this much by this agent and this much by this agent because he's going to pick this one so you see there's always going to be excess supply for good x there's always going to be excess demand for good y and px by py will keep on falling till this budget line becomes absolutely flat it cannot go above by the way it cannot go positively slow why cannot budget line go positively slow because if slope of budget line is positive it means minus px by py is greater than 0 which means that px by py is less than 0 which means that one of the goods is having a negative price right px by py negative means one of the goods has negative price negative price so that's not allowed if they are both goods they must have positive prices if they are bad they can have negative price but we are not going to introduce bad in our particular frame framework we will only consider goods so in equilibrium this thing becomes zero zero means what it means that px upon py becomes equal to zero which means that px must be equal to zero which means that good x becomes free now when i say free i don't mean ki jitna chahiye le lo you still have a voluntary trade thing happening here so come back to my ics of these two agents so this was the ic of agent b and this is the ic of agent a so what happens now is good x becomes free as in agent b is willing to donate good x to agent a okay so x becoming free implies that b is willing to donate x to a and how much will he donate he will donate he is willing to donate up to this much he is willing to donate a maximum of this much because if he donates more than this he becomes worse off he lands on a lower indifference curve right so he is willing to donate this much but look at agent a agent a does not want this much he is saying ki okay the max i want to go is this much because any additional so here agent a's ic becomes like this now even if you put him here or here or here he will still be indifferent so the actual amount of donation will be oh sorry will be something which puts the economy in this segment it could be any of these things doesn't matter which one the point thing is that the equilibrium price vector is zero and, and the economy ends up in this situation okay So why don't you guys analyze and tell me what will be the equilibrium price vector when you start off from this endowment point and who donates what to whom what will be the equilibrium price vector and who donates what to whom
So try it in your notebook. If you're not sitting with one, get it and draw it in your notebook. Draw this figure roughly and then draw some arbitrary budget line and see what will happen to excess demand. So yeah, uh, Vinay, please switch on your mic and keep it on. Yes. Yeah. So what's going to be the demand for agent A in this case? The point of intersection between the budget line and the blue line. Okay, so this is the demand for agent A. What about the demand for agent B? Uh, the intersection between the red line and the budget line. Okay, so this is the demand. So, so let me just highlight these demands now. Okay. So this is the total demand for good X. Do you agree? Yes, sir. So what do we have? Do we have an excess supply or do we have an excess demand? Excess supply, sir. Excess supply, okay. Now, once you figure out that one good has excess supply, you don't even need to see the other demand, other good, because you know, Walrus law says that if there are only two goods, remember Walrus law, Walrus law was P dot X, is equals to zero, which is basically that uh, Px, sorry, P dot Z equals to zero. Okay, so remember Walrus law, let me just skip to Walrus law. So Walrus law was Pz, Px dot Zx plus Py dot Zy is equals to zero. So if Zx is positive, then Zy has to be negative because, you know, prices are always assumed to be positive. So you have excess supply for good X. Now let's look at good Y. These are the demands for good Y, right? So yes, I sir. should see an excess demand for good Y. So what happens to price of good X? So it reduces. And what about price of good Y? Increases. Increases. So the ratio as a whole? Decreases decreases. So this budget line should keep getting flatter and flatter. And this should be true forever. Right? So it should keep getting flatter and flatter. So if it keeps getting flatter and flatter, how flat can it get? What is the minimum slope that you can get? Zero. Sir. Zero. So if Px by Py becomes zero, then what becomes free? X becomes free. X becomes free, okay? So it's the same thing till now. 
let's analyze the ICs of these agents now. So IC of this agent through E. So let me remove the budget lines. I already know it's going to be flat. So I'm just removing the excess things that I have drawn. So I know now PX has become zero. So now I just draw the budget line for agent A, which looks like this. And agent B's indifference curves will be inverted L shape. So they are going to look like this. So if X becomes free, somebody is giving X to somebody from this point, who do you think will be willing to donate X without impacting their utility? So okay, we, if X, if X, if A donates good X, where do you go from this point? If A is donating good X, where does this point move towards? Towards the left. Towards the left. And what happens when B donates good X? It moves to right. Right. Yes, sir. So which of these things leaves the person who's donating indifferent? Situation one or situation two? You see, I will be willing to donate something only when it does not harm me, when it does not reduce my utility. So here in situation one, agent A is the donor. And in situation two, agent B is the donor. So in this case, who, when donating, does not get harmed? So one. One, exactly, agent A. Agent A, when he donates, he moves along his indifference curve. So if he's on the same indifference curve, his utility does not reduce. So agent A will be willing to donate now, all right? Okay. Is this clear? Yes. Now, this is very important. They ask it like every three years, this question, every three years. Okay. So, very important. And it's all analytical, you know, no maths required. Just draw a bunch of lines, draw a bunch of curves, and you're done with it. It's that easy. Okay. So, yeah, you'll see encounter more such problems in the past years and problem set. Let's move to the next case now. We wasted a lot of time today. Uh, so the next case is uh, when the when the two things are intersecting, when the two line of vertices are intersecting. So this is origin of agent A. This is line of vertices of agent A. This is origin of agent B. This is line of vertices of agent B. So first of all, what is the contract code? So I'll start off with some arbitrary point like here. Now from this arbitrary point, I know that these ICs, they look like this. And A's ICs will be L shaped. So A wants to go above his indifference curve, which is this zone. B wants to go below his indifference curve, which is this zone. So obviously, this rectangle is very turn to. Right? So you want to move in this general direction from here. And from here, by similar logic, you want to move in this general direction. So what is your hunch? Let me ask you now, what is the hunch? What can be the contract curve? Based on whatever we have done today, just make a guess, make a random guess. 
both of you just make a random guess don't be afraid there are no points for losing out right now so i don't know why you're afraid just take a guess what do you think would be the contract so for? maybe the point of intersection of these two line of vertices okay good to the point of intersection any other hunch so both the triangles both the triangles very good okay uh so yeah the correct answer is actually both the triangles so my general idea to you kanishka would be look for the larger set and then narrow it down okay so i know that it is somewhere along these lines so my first hunch should be these two triangles because this thing is definitely a smaller set so start with the larger set and then if you don't find pareto efficiency then you move towards something narrower and narrower so start with the larger set start with the coarser set we call it larger is generally called coarser in set theory anyway so yeah the triangles are in fact pareto efficient so let us start with some point inside one of the triangles and verify it so agent a's ic here is going to be looking like this he wants to go above it agent b's ic here is going to look like this he wants to go below it no pareto improvement possible so this is indeed pareto efficient so both these triangles are pareto efficient okay so that's how you are going to do it you have to form some hunch about it and then move accordingly so both these triangles completely pareto efficient now next thing is finding the equilibrium price vector Okay. So start off with some arbitrary budget line. Like this. Oh, nee nee. Kya ho gaya? Tha ta gaya ho gaya. Ha, this one. Yeah. Let's say this is my arbitrary budget line. Uh, okay. let's say this is my arbitrary budget line now i know that agent a will pick this point agent b will pick this point okay total demand for good x is this plus this total demand for good y is this plus this so there is excess supply for good x right because total demand for good x is this and this so this much amount of good which is supplied is not being demanded by anyone which implies px reduces there is excess demand for good y which implies py increases so px by py as a whole should fall right so let me look at a reduced price vector now a flatter budget line which let's say looks like this so this is a relatively flatter budget line this is ab is demanded bundle this is a is demanded bundle so demand for good x now is this coming from this guy and coming from this guy it's going to be this so now the situation is reversed what i have is i have excess supply so the excess demand for x can you see this and now i have an excess demand for x and when i look at good y this is the demand for good y coming from this guy and this is the demand for good y coming from this guy so this much amount of good y which is the difference between these two demands is not being taken up so this much supply of good y is not being taken up by anyone so what i have is excess supply of good y 
So this implies Px should increase. This implies Py should fall. So Px by Py as a whole should fall. No, oh, sorry, should increase. So in the first case I saw, so now let me remove everything, all these extra colors so that we can focus on these two budget lines now. So what I see is in case of the steeper budget line, let me call this as budget line one, it should get flatter. And in case of this budget line two, which is flatter, it should get steeper. So where do you think would be an equilibrium budget line? What will be the characteristic of this equilibrium budget line? Which will see excess demands equal out to zero. So it should go through the point of intersection. Very good. So it should pass through the point of intersection. So when I draw a line passing through the point of intersection now like this, now agent A demands his intersection point with budget line, which is this point. And agent B also demands the same point. If both people demand the same point, there is no reason to have excess demands. And that's why it will, the market clears, everything is happy. So that's your analysis that the price vector is going to be the endowment point. The, in the slope, of this endowment point and this intersection point. This is going to be your price vector Px by Py. Okay. So I have the contract curve, I have the price vector. All right. Now, your homework for today is I'm, I'm stopping here. I don't want to proceed any further because, you know, things are difficult. These are difficult things to understand. One and a half hours is a long enough time. So your homework for today is just work out one thing. So do watch this video again. Okay, it's going to be difficult. So your homework is, yeah, I've seen this case where uh, these two agents, the endowment point was working out fine. But what about a situation which looks like this? Okay, so this is for agent A and this is for agent B. Your endowment point is actually here. So that now, you know, you cannot connect this endowment point with this point because now the budget line will be upward sloping. Budget line can never be upward sloping because that means negative prices. So this cannot be the budget line, okay? So in this case, when you have endowment point positioned here, which is basically If you draw per perpendicular lines passing through the intersection point, it is in this zone. So if you have endowment point here, what's going to be the equilibrium price vector? And if it is something like free, something is getting free, then who is donating to whom? Okay, so that's your homework, all right? And I'll ask you this in the next class. Let's have it tomorrow and let's wrap it up. So unless something happens, some major uh, emergency happens, I'll take it tomorrow and we will wrap this thing up. It will be a one hour class, one, one and a half hour max. Okay. So that's your homework. Revise the video and then do this problem. Okay. All right. So ending the class now. I'll see you guys tomorrow.